Alex here with a video on, uh, I was going to call it part two of the Masterson letters, but this time it's not actually going to be based on the letters. It'll be based on the verdict. So we'll just call it the Masterson verdict. So this is one of those videos that I initially was not going to do because the request that I got was not in line with my opinion. But then the more I thought about it and the more interesting um, details that popped up on it, I found that it actually probably is a good topic for this channel. I'm just going to take it in another direction. So probably I looked at probably two or three different things. I looked at the verdict. I looked at some clips people sent me on post-trial coverage. And I also thought about my initial reaction. Uh, so the I guess we'll start off with some of the messages that I've been getting have to do with the Scientology, the Church of Scientology's link to the case. And... If you think about it, when I did my first video on this topic, the Masterson letters, that really was not on my radar at all. And then when I thought about it more, the entire Masterson, Masterson case was not on my radar. So really, the one thing that popped up was the Ashton Kutcher and Myla Kunis letters. And that was the only thing that I had any clue of. I dug into the case more, and I um, want to go ahead and tie one of the videos that was sent to me in which was a video on Leah Ramini, specifically a clip, and I can't find it now, so I'm not going to track it down. But it was specifically a clip where she was upset because she was in court and only one of the people that had been supporting the victims actually showed up. I guess there were... Uh, this is a, lo a lot of this is retroactive. Um, and I, and I, I'm going to go into why. This was not a Johnny Depp case, which is is kind of what the messages that have been sent to me are trying to make it look like. So with the Johnny Depp case, we have an accuser who was ultimately proved to have been falsely accused, or sorry, we have a, an accused, which is Johnny Depp, who was ultimately proved to have been falsely accused. And of course, everybody knows the I'm not even sure there's a word to describe the impact that case had on public opinion. It may, it, it was, I mean, I, I can barely compare o OJ to it because I was so young at the time the OJ trial was going on. But for from what it seemed to me, the case was without question enormous. It, it was so enormous that it created entire not even just YouTube channels. It created an entire YouTube sector that they call LawTube, I guess. So it was so huge. And the reason why it was so huge and the reason why I knew everything about it, even while it was ongoing, by the way, I didn't. I hardly watched any of that trial, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that I hardly watched any of the trial because so many other people were watching the trial and were discussing it that I was able to follow it without even, it was that intense. And it had to do with the cameras in the courtroom. So I took a look at the complaint that Leah Ramini had about hardly any of the victim support groups following it. She said only one person showed up to court with her. Not with her, but that she noticed at the courthouse in the courtroom. And um, from, from what I can tell, the case, the Masterson case, was not televised. I uh, I saw an article saying something like that the Masterson retrial might have cameras. That's all that I saw on it. I looked all over YouTube. I didn't see any footage of the proceedings. And that is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, because I noticed the same thing that Ramini noticed, Leah Ramini noticed, is that a lot of people want to talk about a case without actually going to the case, without actually... Uh, they they so the, you have a lot of people covering a case that are just getting information secondhand from other people. So uh, besides talking about physical, who actually goes to a courtroom and watches, I was also going to mention that this is not anywhere near the magnitude of the Johnny Depp trial because it wasn't publicly covered. Uh, sorry, because it, there was no camera access. Another thing I'm going to go ahead and say is this is 2023. So a lack of camera access, in my opinion, is a lack of public access. I mean, this is just my personal opinion. The law doesn't see it that way. The law distinguishes between camera access and First Amendment. And 
the law could do that all day long, but 2023, if there's not a camera in the courtroom, it's just nobody just, it's just, it's all hearsay. You're, you're just getting your information from people who are reporting on it. You're not able to see it for yourself. It's not even close. It's not even remotely close to what happened in the Depp trial for that reason. So it's, if I was going to put a percentage of interest on the Masterson case versus the Depp case and the public impact, I, maybe one one hundredth of a percent, it's that, it's that much smaller. So now in retrospect, I went and I looked and I see a lot of this news coverage. I'm not even really sure it's mainstream. We're talking YouTube, maybe some blog stuff. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some mainstream effort behind it. I, I, I see now sort of after the verdict has come out, there's more attempts to link Scientology. And I guess part of that is because there were, there was testimony, but nobody saw or heard the testimony. And it looks like one of those situations where people waited until after the decision came out to try and draw the connections. All of these things are what weakened the, the impact um, of, I guess, groups that are trying to connect Scientology. And then of course the church itself, from what I looked at, apparently expelled Mr. Masterson. So none of the, you know, none of the, the points that the requests that I'm getting from people actually, in my opinion, are as true as I think a lot of people want them to be. So, um, by the way, I don't want to sort of, I don't know if I can even really speculate as to why camera access was denied because I couldn't find any information on that. As it, it, I could only assume that the victims in some way interfered with that because they personally wanted to keep themselves concealed. Just in, my So like when I see victims who want to protect their identity before the verdict, but then after the verdict comes out, then they want to reveal themselves. To me, it looks like they were waiting to see if they would win or not, even though the states, the prosecutor, the victims, the accusers often sort of feel like if the person gets convicted, they won, and if not, they lost. Um, which anybody can do, and I understand why they would want to do that, but it definitely weakens the impact because once the case is already done, all you really have is a bunch of labels and, and you, people don't really have the experience of observing the case all the way through. It also kind of indicates to me that the victims probably didn't really care about the Scientology link and probably just wanted to see Mr. Masterson convicted. Uh, if they would have prioritized the former, there would have probably been a different outcome on the camera access issue. So most likely the victims got what they wanted, which was the conviction and incarceration of Mr. Masterson. And now the stuff about the Scientology church coming out is just uh, sort of an afterthought is what it seems like. Um, so yeah, let's now go to what I really wanted to talk about, which was Leah Romini being upset about only um, one group showing up in the courtroom. So with our Nevada judges, I have recorded six trials and I have noticed the exact same thing that Ms. Romini noticed. There are a lot of people who will support somebody in litigation but they're just going to post some stuff on social media they might do a video on it if they're a youtuber that's all they're not going to actually go and sit in the courtroom this is just probably i can't help smiling because <laughs> i can understand her frustration and a lot of people's frustration on this issue it's very counterintuitive because there's so many people that say so many things online and they have so much passion behind it. And they're like, I am there for you, but they don't go to court. And this is because it's a lot of work to go to court. It really is. And I, there's no question that the people who go and sit in the courtroom are people who are connected very intimately to the case or their participants. And this, I've noticed this in all six trials that I've covered with our Nevada judges. It's the lawyers, it's the judge, and it's the parties. They're the ones that go to court. And sometimes the parties, like in a criminal case, their family will show up. I've noticed that too, which makes sense. So the people who show up have a lot of motive to showing up and, um, the only real neutral people who I've seen show up is the media. 
And I know some people don't think they're neutral, but for the most part, they are. I mean, I've done this stuff for a few years now, and I can understand the distinction, and I can understand why some people in the public get confused. But for the most part, they are. It's they're there. I mean, they, it's a paycheck. It's your job, and that it's easy to go and do something when you're being paid because then it's your job. Um, a lot of people have jobs, and they don't want to go and do more work, which is how they see it. They don't see the courtroom as fun. They see the courtroom as work. You got to drive all the way down there. You got to pay for parking. You got to go through uh, security. And then you got to sit around and do a whole lot of waiting. And then you have no idea what you're going to get. So it's not like you, you're going, it's not like you know something amazing is going to happen. It's a complete and total crapshoot. It could be a two minute hearing. It could be a 20 minute hearing. It could be an hour hearing. It could have six hours of boring testimony. Or it could have, in the case of Michael McDonald, a fight in the courtroom with the bailiffs. You just have no idea. So it's a lot of effort and investment for a person to go sit in there with, and they have no idea what the outcome is going to be. Which is why I think a lot of times in these cases, people get excited once the outcome is known. And um, sadly, it greatly diminishes the impact of a case on public opinion because the public doesn't have the experience and their own personal observations of what happened. They only have such and such convicted 30 years the end. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think um, the federal court's failure to allow camera coverage of the Epstein trial was tremendously damaging on the public view of the government. Um, it was, it was, it was a mistake that I cannot put into words for the government to fail to allow camera access to that case. Um, and that's the decision they wanted to make and they have to live with the, the, the fallout from that because all the conspiracy theories, rather than getting quelled, amplified on the Epstein situation um, because of the federal judiciary's failure to allow camera access. But here we have a different situation. It's a different court. They could have allowed camera access and they didn't. And we have... Um, uh, people who apparently, and I say apparently because I had no idea. I mean, the first video that I did on the Masterson case, I didn't even know anything about the movements behind it and the attempts to link Scientology and the uh, um, the victims. I didn't know anything about that. When 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 uh, the uh, Johnny Depp trial's going. I mean, you were every little tiny, I mean, every little tiny detail was all over the internet all the time. Every day there was something new on that. So with the Masterson case, I think it speaks volumes that my first video on it had to do with these letters of support sent at sentencing. Um, and that's it. <laughs> so yeah, guys, my observations are that in the real world, People are, and this is the conclusion of this video, I think people and the public and society are extremely interested in these court cases. They are, but not so interested that they're going to take time out of their day and sit in the courtroom. And I do not think that it's fair to call that laziness. Even with these groups that were, um, even with these groups that were apparently super supportive of the victims and made all of these public statements. I understand that to Leah Ramini, that was frustrating. And I'm using her as an example to show how counterintuitive this issue is. But in hindsight, having covered six trials, I understand why people want to observe from the comfort of their homes. Not only do I think that that is fair, I actually think that that is appropriate. You can't fit a million people in a courtroom. They don't fit in that courtroom. It's too small. So when you have a country of, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of Americans, 400, I don't know, it's completely reasonable for them to consume the operation of the courts and, and the whole process and experience on their phone or on their TV screen. It's, it, it is. And so 
that's just how it is nowadays. You know, it's not, we're not like back in 1776 or whatever, when it, the towns were like hundred people lived there and people could just go hang out in court. It's a different time now. It's very, very different time. And so um, people want to, I, I very strongly believe that people want to know what's going on in the courts, but they don't want to drive down there. And that's, that's totally fair. Uh, if people want to watch on their phone at their leisure, if they want to watch the parts that are important to them, if they want to watch the whole thing, if they want to do those things, they should be allowed to do those things. And um, that didn't happen with this case. And for those uh, reasons, it's not a, a Johnny Depp uh, style case. It's just not. Um I think one of the last things I'll talk about before I close this video out is electronic coverage and camera access to these cases is important for a big reason. When judges are doing their jobs and lawyers are doing their jobs, you have a situation where the only people who can see them are the people who have the most interest in a case and the most reason to be biased. The lawyers are there arguing. The parties, I mean, they're parties to the case. They care about the outcome. Um, their family members, in case of a criminal case, I see that. Of course, they care about their family member. These people are not going to give top priority to the operation of the court, to an objective analysis of the attorneys and how well they're doing their job and the judge. They have an, a very strong emotional reason that made them show up physically and sit in the courtroom. So the people who are there in person are the least qualified people to judge what the judge is doing and what the court is doing. And so this idea of transparency through physical access is ridiculous. The best people who are going to judge the judge and the court system and the operation of the courts and the procedure are the more dispassionate people, the people who are the least connected to the case, who are the least interested in the outcome, the people who are the most ambivalent, the people who have no motivation to drive all the way down there and go through the line, security line, and sit there for hours. But the people who will watch through their screens on their phones. So physical access is just, it's mostly meaningless. If you're looking at, if you want society to be educated on the operation of the courts and on what's going on and, and to form the strongest possible opinion and to have the strongest possible societal impact. If you want the people to not only learn about the courts, but to get an objective sort of perspective on how the court operates and how important American procedure is or a judicial procedure, whatever country really, it has, it has to be made available to the people who are the least connected. The, and those are the people who won't go down there. They're only going to, if you let them watch on their phone or on their screen or TV screen, they will watch it and they will form a positive, most likely, it's what I usually see. When, when disconnected, ambivalent, dispassionate people watch through their screens, they usually form a very positive opinion about our court system, at least here in Nevada. Usually they do. Some of them have very valid complaints. Typically the complaint is something like the uh, court continues the hearings too often and it's like a tax impact. But for the most part, the, the different steps like arraignment and the uh, the pleading phase and the discovery phase and then the trial and how that's broken down into three or four different phases and how, you know, that kind of stuff, a lot of people don't know how elaborate it is. And when they watch that, they, they gain confidence in the judiciary. They do. Most of them do. Overwhelming majority of them do. Um, 
And the people who couldn't care less are the ones that are physically in the courtroom that want to see their son get a not guilty verdict or that want to win a million dollars because they're the plaintiff or they, if they're the attorney, they want to win their case. If they're the judge, like these are the people who, who are the least interested in an objective analysis on the court system and are the most interested in the outcome. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the situation. That's the reality of it. I mean, the, one of the bigger cases we had was the Kim Blandino case. Um, and all the time, all the days that um, Brittany was there filming, I was there actually for a lot of it because it was live streamed. And I noticed, I mean, I looked around and I was like, hmm, this is an insane case. We have so, so much interest in this case on our on our website, YouTube. And I looked around and I'd be like, there's no one here. Nobody. One day there was a person, one of our viewers came from like Colorado. <laughs> we took him out to eat. That was one day. And he was only there because we were, <laughs> it's so counterintuitive. You would think that if you don't allow camera access, that more people will show up. I don't think that's the case. I think it's the other way around. It's like, it's like, hey, if we ban cameras, more people will be will have to come and sit and watch. Nah, they're, they're just not going to do that. They're not going to go. They're not going to go and do that. And then the situation where you have camera access, you would be like, oh, okay, nobody's going to need, nobody's going to come because they can just watch it on YouTube. Actually, the interest in the case gets ramped up and they're more likely to go and sit in there because I think it has to do with, it becomes a discussion. So like you're at work or you, you have friends and everyone starts to watch it. And so then everyone starts to form opinions and then everyone can kind of relate to it. And so then it becomes a discussion for society. And then the discussion makes people more and more interested in it. And then you actually get people who are like, I'm going to go in there and sit there and watch because it's like they have no connection to the case. They don't really care about the outcome, at least at first. And they start to watch and they start to form opinions. And then all of a sudden it's like, now they want to go in person because it's like, it's ramping up. It's like every, you can come back and talk to people about what you saw and what was different. And when there is no camera access, that sort of spark doesn't turn into a flame. It's just like, it's, it's just, it's like a lower layer of interest. There's like, there's the higher le layer of interest, which is your own eyes and ears observing and your brain recording your experience very differently, more like a personal observation. And then there's the lower level of interest, which is secondhand information. So you, you, your brain just doesn't record that the same way because you didn't see it or hear it. Instead, you read about it or heard from some other person who says they saw it. And you, it like when somebody tells you something happened, your brain just doesn't give it as high a level of importance as if you had watched it happening with your own eyes and ears. So, I mean, I guess that's all I have to say about it, guys. The uh, the the master situation had a tiny fraction of interest simply because, unlike the Depp case, it wasn't televised. And as Leah Ramini pointed out, and as I have observed, a lot of people will have a lot of interest in talking about a situation and saying that they're going to back somebody up. But when it comes down to going to the courtroom, they just won't do it. And that is not something that's unique to her case. I think she mentioned something about how they didn't like maybe people didn't want to be attacked by uh, Scientology because they have a reputation for that or something like that. But from my experience, that's not true because I have covered six different trials and it's the same for all of them. Observers just don't show up ever, even for Michael McDonald, one of our top cases. So Kim Blandino and Michael McDonald, I can't, I mean, it was, it was always the same people who went to the courtroom, the lawyers. Sometimes the family would show up for parts of it. But like I meant, I mean, that's the family. I mean, that doesn't count. That's not an observer right off the street who, no, I mean, these people all have a very strong emotional reason to be there and a very strong um, interest in the outcome. So that there you have it, guys. That's the reality of the year 2023 is um, if it's not televised, 
it's nothing. 